Welcome to Earthworks, guys. So glad you guys came tonight. So glad you're here. You look so, y'all look so handsome and beautiful in the sunset tonight. All the beautiful colors. I wanted to let you know that Earthworks was born in 1988. Two native Jacksonville businessmen had dinner together and decided to leave their corporate jobs and start a lawn maintenance company. They decided to make a living cutting grass. They decided that um, they would go ahead and leave their corporate jobs. One was in insurance and one was in banking. They decided to leave those two jobs. And rumor has it or legend has it that the two men did not talk to their wives about their decision before they did it. Um, it's, from what I understand, Doug McGregor and Mark Fechtel purchased necessary lawn maintenance equipment and stored it at Mark's house, making his wife ecstatic, I'm sure. With a focus on customer service, excellent teamwork, and integrity, the business grew into a small landscape company through word of mouth. Doug and Mark began planting shrubs and trees in customers' yards, as well as maintaining them. The two men, seemingly energized by a challenge, decided to add to the maintenance and landscape business by purchasing this property on Beach Boulevard in 1999. It was cleared by Doug and Mark and their team, no easy task. The garden center opened in the spring of 2000. Doug single-handedly, all by himself, opened, ran, and closed the shop that day and made a full circle back to the day when he was a teenager and worked part-time at a garden center in Arlington here in Jacksonville. In 2006, Matthew Barlow joined the team at the garden center, bringing his unique gift of knowledge of the plant world. His tasks varied day to day depending on the need of the company. You may have seen him unloading trees at that time, planting trees, uh, purchasing plants for the company, selling plants, or talking to customers about gardening. Matthew struggled with earthworks through the construction on B Beach Boulevard years ago. He struggled through the recession with the company in 2008, and he most recently struggled through the building of the apartments next door, which caused us to have to reconstruct our entire property and rethink the garden center and relocate both our maintenance and our landscape departments to St. John's Bluff. He is not easily flustered. He's a thinker. He's creative. He's passionate about all things living, and he's interested in how they intertwine with each other. Today, Matthew manages this garden center beside me. He is always pressing us to move forward. Like Doug and Mark 34 years ago, he is customer focused, and he leans into our staff and our community. He's an incredible asset, and a, and a compliment to our other two departments. I've had the privilege of working with Matthew since 2018. He notices and appreciates the world around him. He is curious and whimsical, and he's my treasured friend. And it's my pleasure to introduce him to you tonight. This is Matthew Barlow. Thank you guys, thank you. Yeah. I like this to be as interactive as possible. I want to be productive. I want you to go home inspired and have lots of ideas of how you can work your lawn and your landscape and, um, and be uh, successful in that effort. Okay, so now I'm gonna take your temperature a little bit here. Um, this is a welcome to Northeast Florida. Now there might be some people from Florida here and that's okay um, because what you're about to hear will explain why it's okay that you would find a native Floridian in this class, okay? Um, how many of you spent most of your life living north of the Mason-Dixon line. Could you raise your hand? Okay, so quite a bit from the north. Now, of the north, northeast, northeast, northwest, any northwesterners? Okay. How many like southwest? Anyone from the southwest? No? So most everybody north. How many are Floridians but from a different part of Florida? Kinda? Okay, just tell me where you're from then. Originally New York, but I've been here about 50 years. So okay, okay. Both places? Both places, yeah. So we have a lot of people from the north, right? Okay, so I'll kind of focus a little bit in that direction. Um, it's, it's, it tends to be the, tre uh, the, the trend because we're so far south. So most everybody has come from a place a little bit further north of us, all right? So the further north you go, um, the more temperate you become as far as your climate goes. 
you keep going north and you get to Arctic. And um, hopefully none of us will get to experience that again unless we're on a cruise or a vacation looking at icebergs and, and things like that. Um, Northeast Florida, uh, okay, let me ask another question real quick. How many of you have been here less than a year? Anyone less than a year? Okay, one, anyone less than five years? Okay, we have several less than five years. Of those people, less than five years, how many of you have, you, how many of you have mastered gardening in Northeast Florida? Okay. Okay. Anyone here 10 years? Okay. Have you mastered gardening in Northeast Florida? Pretty much with your help. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, you look familiar. Okay. So what, what I'm kind of getting at is there is a very unique challenge gardening here in this zone. And in a lot of ways, um, I think the term garden purgatory <laughs> is really the best term for where we are. It's a really strange place. So I grew up in the suburban cornfields of Indianapolis, Indiana, okay? My mother was an avid gardener. I watched as much as possible. I was forced to work the garden, not by choice, so I picked up some skills along the way. But it's completely different. And um, I'll tell you a story that illustrates just how naive I was when I first moved here. I um, purchased a home. My mother always had like a 20 by 40 garden. It was huge. Every year, when the ground was soft enough, you remember that? When the ground was soft enough to take a shovel to, because it would freeze. You guys remember that, how terrible that was? Um, like actual frozen earth. And for some of you who have never lived that far north, it's a real thing. It's so it's called concrete. Yeah, it feels like if you fall down and there's not snow, it's hard. Um, it's really hard, you know, and then after that, then there's the mud season. You all remember the mud season? Everything's mushy for a long period of time. So I grew up there, clay soil, hard, rocky. Even when it wasn't permafrost, even during the best times, it was still really hard to dig a hole. And so I remember my mom after the thaw, she had a friend at church who had a rototiller. Remember those? You don't need them here. Um, learned that the hard way. So, um, so she would have this lady come and she and my mom would, you know, for an hour or so chunking up the clay so my mom could get her vegetable garden in. And that would happen every year like clockwork, pretty much. So when I had a home and had a property, I wanted to do a garden just like mom. And so I went to Lowe's or Home Depot, rented a pickup truck, rented a little ramp, rented a rototiller, rented a sod cutter. <clears throat> they loaded them up in the truck. I got home, I unloaded them, got them all in the backyard, got the sod cutter out first because that's the order of operations. You get the sod off first. Now this was June in Northeast Florida. That was kind of like May, June is when we were doing up in Indiana, right? So I was kind of thinking, trying to remember. I got, I called mom, like, when did you do the garden? She's like, you know, May, you know, June, depends on how warm or cold it was, you know? It's like, all right. So that's my time to do my garden here. And so uh, I was in the backyard. So it was like end of May or June, either way it was hot. I mean, I had got the sod stripped. I think I'd gone through two shirts already, two or three shirts, dripping in sweat, dragging the sod to the front yard so the yard waste guys would get it. And I was like so stoked that I was getting ready to now rototill it and then the rototilling that then it would be the uh, putting the plants and the seeds in. So I stood by the open plot and I, I stared at it and, and something looked very strange and it didn't look like clay. And if you have taken a shovel to the ground here already, you know that we're, it's sand. So the rototiller obviously was, was overkill. And that was my very first rude awakening that I was not in Kansas anymore. I wasn't in Indiana anymore. I was in a foreign land with this white powdery beige stuff that didn't look anything like what I used to grow things in. And so a lot of you have probably come to that realization already. And the sandy soil is brutal for plants that are not native, okay? So if you want to imagine what loves the poor sandy soil, take a walk at the Arboretum and look at all the native plants growing in the forest. Take a walk at Hannah Park and see all the wild plants growing. That's what likes to grow in sandy soil. And there are probably other plants too, like go to the edges of the deserts and, and look at plants that are growing in that sandy soil. Um, 
You know, it's interesting, speaking of deserts, uh, you know, uh, when I first moved here, we still had some very large dunes in some strange parts of towns here. The dunes, most of them are gone. Lots of neighborhoods are built on them in kind of the northeast Arlington area. Um, if you look across the Atlantic and see what's directly across from us in a very similar parallel, it's the Sahara Desert. So keep praying that we get at least four feet of rain a year, um, like we do here, because that's what keeps us lush and green. Um, but we are very sandy without all the moisture and the, and the particular climate that we have, we would be uh, look a little bit different. So what do we do with this thing that's not really soil? Um, it's dirt, it's sand. Um, the first thing that we really need to be beginning to think about is what, what does it take to grow healthy plants? And that is something that's called soil. Soil is what occurs right over here naturally, okay? So when I'm thinking about my garden, whether I'm growing edibles, which I still love to grow edibles, and I did learn how to do it, it took a long time. Um, I'll, I'll come back around because I'm a little ADD. So the end of that gardening story was that I'd also purchased a whole bunch of plants and a whole bunch of seeds. I stuck them in the ground, I watered them. And I don't know how often I watered them after that, but within a month, everything was dead. Everything was dead. I mean, these were things I should have planted back like in February, March, you know. Um, so there's a huge learning curve for a lot of us when we first moved down here. The timing is all different and, and we can start to figure it out, but it does take a little bit of time and a little bit of trial and error. And we have to forgive ourselves because um, a lot of us have egos and, um, you know, we might have been very successful gardeners and gardeners in other parts of the world. We moved down here and we're like, what the H happened to my gardening skills when I moved down here? It's like I'm doing the same things. So there are some things that translate. But if we're not thinking about the soil, if we're not thinking about building soil, we're going to have a lot of mixed success, a lot of mixed success. And the real trial through my 20 years of being here now, the real um, trial and error that I have found is that um, if we don't prepare the soil, if we don't think about amending the soil, and if we don't think about trying to build soil, um, then we will have a lot of that mixed success here. So. If we have established beds, it's not like we can just tear everything out. That doesn't make sense. Um, so how would we build soil um, if we have established plants and beds? We can't dig up where all the roots are and dump in all this really good soil. So we have to think about what's called top dressing. Top dressing. Um, and so top dressing is a term that's used a lot in vegetable gardening. After you have established vegetables, you'll throw a little compost on the top. And then as it rains or as you water, it begins to break down and feed the plants. So doing top dressings with things like compost is very important. Uh, we actually have a product called top dressing. Um, it's fantastic. It's easy to remember, top dressing. It goes on the top. Um, you can pull the mulch back, put some top dressing down, or time it to when you're doing a mulch refresh. You could, if you're using pine bark, which is my favorite, you could put on top of an old layer of pine bark and put fresh on top of it and it will break down and help feed your plants. And it'll work its way into the soil. So if you have established beds, that's gonna be the most cost-effective way um, of, of creating and start to think about building the soil up. Um, I mentioned pine bark mulch. Pine bark and pine straw, if plants could talk to us, um, they would thank us for using it. Uh, from a plant's perspective, it is the best mulch to use um, for several reasons. Um, the first reason um, that they like it is because our soil tends to lean a little alkaline here in Duval County. The pine bark and pine mulch is a little acid. It's very mild. It's not highly acidic, but it will bring it toward neutral and maybe even over time begin to lean it toward the acidic. So a majority of plants lean neutral or an acid. Um, so that's a, a one really good reason why they like it. The second reason is that the pine bark and pine mulch composts very well okay so if you use the um if you use the shredded what they call the uh the cypress um, it's actually pine wood and there's nothing wrong with it it comes in colors it's attractive um, but it doesn't really give any benefit to the plants per se other than being a nice layer on top maybe slowing down the penetration of weeds but as you all have probably noticed the weeds will grow in anything they grow in cracks um, they, it's, you know, it, the, the mulch is more for an aesthetic if you're just using the cypress. 
Um, and, and I'm not judging it, but I will say that um, you will notice a huge difference if you transition to the pine products. Because when what happens with the pine, pine bark and the pine straw is they break down and they become food for the soil, all the living organisms in the soil, all the microbes that we rely upon, and then also the plants themselves once it breaks down to a point to where they can absorb them. The third benefit is for us. Um, with the pine um, shredded stuff, with the shredded cypress mulch, what they call it, it actually it breaks down so slowly that it begins to compact. And most of us don't like taking it out every season and putting it fresh. We just keep layering on top, layering on top, and it begins to become more and more compact. And what that begins to do, because of our sandy soil, things move through and into the sandy soil rather easily as opposed to like clay or rocky soil. So you have all have purchased cereal before and all the good stuff, all the marshmallows and the nuts and the berries are at the bottom. Well, all, that, all of our stuff on top begins to work its way down. And so when we're using good inputs, that's awesome. But if it's a hard wood, it starts to get in there and compact and cuts off the airflow to the surface roots, okay? So that stresses the plants out. So we are literally doing things to our soil, I mean, to our plants unknowingly that are inhibiting them from thriving, okay? So cutting off the airflow to roots is very detrimental. Our roots need oxygen, okay? So when they become smothered with layers and layers, and I've gone to job sites before where the mulch is like this thick sometimes, and those plants just can't breathe, okay? And then imagine we get a month of rain. So then they're sitting in water and they're smothered by that thick layer of mulch and they choke. And then the, the leaves and the shrubs start falling off because the roots are rotting, okay? So a lot of things are happening in the soil that we don't see constantly. And it's not until the top part of the plant starts to suffer that we begin to think about it. But by that time, the damage is probably already done, all right? So transitioning to pine bark and pine uh, straw will give your plants a huge advantage. I know it's not everyone's favorite aesthetic, um, but it is ideal. And the pine bark, yes, ma'am. So it, it's interesting to talk about this because I've always used pine straw. Mm -hmm. And this past year, I thought maybe I was getting too acidic, so I switched to like the mm -hmm. cypress stuff. And I had more trouble with powdery mildew. Yes. And it took out all sorts yes. of stuff. And I was blaming the mulch. Am I right then? Probably. It's probably the mulch. If that's the one well, of the... I never had trouble with it in the past, but I... You, I mean, to be scientific about it, we'd have to have many years of trials right, and studies. Right. But, I mean, that is a... There's a correlation there. I mean, is it well, a... Co that, that yeah. That wasn't my mind. And, you know, I'm yeah. like... I never use it. I will say that like gardens that use the, that cypressy stuff are more problematic. Yeah, and, and in those, I didn't even lay that much down, but it, it just it took out so many things yeah. that should grow easily. And uh, yeah, and the other nice thing too about the pine bark and pine straw is you can put it down thicker. It's a lot more. It's a lot lighter, a lot airier, and you could put it down thicker, and it still allows for the airflow, so you can choke out weeds. I did an experiment. We had a vegetable garden up uh, over by where the greenhouse is now. <laughs> And I, we, our summer is kind of like a dormant season from growing vegetables here. So rather than trying to grow anything, what, what I wanted to experiment was uh, I wanted to see if I put down a really thick layer of pine straw, um, if any weeds would grow in it. So I put about, I think it was six to eight inches of pine straw cover the entire bed. And from, I think, June until about September, October, when I was beginning to transition to the fall garden, there wasn't a single weed that grew in there. Not a single weed, not even in the pine, like not a single weed. I, I was shocked. I thought there would be a, a handful. I knew it would suppress and keep seeds from germinating. I was surprised that seeds did not germinate in it. Now you'd only wanna put it that thick in areas um, in between the plants, not right under them, okay? But in the vacant areas, in the spaces between the plants, you can, Put that pine bark and pine straw extra thick and really help suppress the weeds uh, considerably. Um, so th there's a lot of benefits to it. So let me backtrack a little bit. I, I had mentioned the forest. So the forest is always my model when growing. And my brain is so hyper fixated on growing food, uh, specifically tomatoes. I'm a freak. Uh, I'm one of those people who will spend more money growing a single tomato then it'd just be cheaper if I just go to the grocery store, you know? Um, but I don't like the ones at the grocery store, although Publix now is selling heirloom tomatoes. You can find them now, which is 
amazing because I don't eat the other things because they're not really tomatoes. If you have never had an heirloom tomato, I challenge you to purchase one no matter if you think it's too expensive or not because once you eat it, it's going to remind you of the tomatoes you ate as a child. Uh, a real tomato. All the new ones, the Franken tomatoes that taste like cardboard or paste and have no flavor. Anyway, I'm a freak about tomatoes and so I'm always trying to think about like what the forest does. We think about the forest, we walk through a forest and the forest is beautiful and it's healthy and it's vibrant and it takes care of itself without human intervention. Usually when forests are struggling, it's either because of a freak pest or a freak disease that moves through for a time or humans are doing something stupid that messes it up. So the forest is ingenious. It's a, it's a perfect circle. It's a perfect cycle of life. It provides its own food. Wouldn't it be nice if we could produce something out of our body that sounds weird that would produce our own food for us? We didn't have to go get it somewhere else. Well, the leaves drop, the branches drop. If there's an old squirrel, it drops. Everything drops to the forest floor and becomes compost, right? And it just keeps happening over and over and over and over. And the forest is this perfect model. So what do we do in our yards? We take everything out. We don't want that dead possum laying in the front yard or the armadillo or the squirrel, and that's fine. But what do we do when we mow our lawns? We take all the clippings away from it. We're robbing our lawn of the leaves. Oh, they're so trashy. The HOA is gonna find me, oh, the leaves. Well, you can at least mow over them and return them back to the earth, but what are we doing systematically? We're systematically creating a barren hostile environment we scratch our heads and we pay hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars trying to make our grass green when if we just do some simple stuff like our grannies and our grandpas did we'd have the most beautiful lawn in our whole neighborhood what did they do, Grandma and Grandpa? well they sure as heck didn't remove all the clippings yeah. right yeah. Um, and it depends on what part of the country you're from too so up north where I grew up my dad never fertilized the lawn he never had a spreader. We had the greenest grass, just like everyone in our neighborhood, because we just mowed the grass, mulched the clippings, and then in the, in the fall, my dad would make sure that we mowed a couple times when there's leaves down. Then we had a giant maple tree, and my mom, we'd make a big pile, then my brother and I would climb up in the tree and jump in the pile that was like eight, 10 feet tall. And then after we're done playing, probably the next morning on a Sunday or something after church, We'd get all the leaves and we'd stuff them under the bushes in the beds. We'd put them all up in the beds. Because by that time, all the bulbs and all the things were all dormant. We'd shove them underneath there. So that way, when the snow fell, okay, and they had that freeze thaw, freeze thaw, freeze thaw at the tail end of winter, it'd be breaking down that mulch litter uh, from the leaves and it'd be almost compost by the time it was warm enough to do gardening. So you're saying pine bark and pine needles. Pine bark and pine needles will give you that similar effect. Now we luckily don't get the freeze thaw, freeze thaw, freeze thaw to, to speed up that composting process, uh, but they will break down. And the nice thing is, is that you can keep layering on top of it. And that bottom layer is turning into compost, okay? Depending on your preference, I mean, you can literally turn your beds into a compost bin. You have to get creative to make it look nice. But you could, like, if you were to time a big lawn mowing and saving those grass clippings, layer them over some older mulch, and then time it to put your fresh mulch right on top of those grass clippings. Kind of think about layering and composting. So you need carbon and you need nitrogen, oxygen and water to make compost. Um, so the green is nitrogen, the brown, the dry stuff is carbon. Um, so you could think about layering as well, but you can actually, for relatively inexpensively get some compost, buy compost, it's relatively inexpensive and just do sections, you know. Um, we sell um, some compost mix in, in bulk as well. Um, but are you guys beginning to kind of see the picture and the model of, of what we're talking about? So by constantly removing all the potential nutrients that could be returning to the soil, we're starving the plants and we're starving the microbiology, okay? So we don't have a very complex web, first of all, in our sandy soil, okay? In our sandy dirt, because it's not truly soil. And I don't believe that it has the same microbial life that we would find in the forest. If we were to measure our lawns microbial life and then the forest microbial life, it would be completely different, okay? 
So we have to be putting organic matter into our soil. So whether that's grass clippings or mowing over the leaves on occasion and getting that to break down, um, if it's using top dressing. So there is a top dressing product that we carry that's all natural. So whether you get it from us or somewhere else, you can put it in a spreader and it's just little fine compost that you can put in and it helps build the soil. And you can do it in big batches, you can do it in small batches. You can call our maintenance company in the winter and they do it, they'll do a core kind of like aeration. They'll do put these plugs in your lawn to open it up and then they'll come over with this giant spreader and they'll, they'll spread it all for you. Um, or you can do it yourself. But I would say do something um, because otherwise we have a, a stressed out lawn and a stressed out garden. Now stressed out plants um, are, they're almost like a beacon to insects. They are literally, not almost, they're literally a beacon to insects. So when plants are stressed, okay, so we're putting um, plants into a stressful environment, number one. And then number two, if we are contributing to that stress, um, they are, they're gonna be emitting chemicals literally into the air. And the insects can pick up on those chemicals, okay? So a stress plant is like a victim here um, in, the plant, in, the, in the insect world, and they will literally come in droves and they'll attack your plants. So it's, it's interesting, and if you've gardened long enough, you'll see a stress plant, you don't see bugs, but then not too long after, they'll have bugs on them. And that's, that's, that's the reason why. So then you have a double whammy, and then you can get a triple whammy when the, if it's a, a sap sucking insect and the insect sucking the sap out of it and then excreting its waste, which is the processed sap onto the plant. And then you start having mold, black sooty mold and fungal issues all over the plant. Um, at that point, it's probably a lot cheaper just to buy a new plant and put it in. But what if you have a big, beautiful shrub, you know, and you have to start over with a little one, that's no fun, right? So thinking about the soil is really the best preventative way to think about gardening here. Um, and like I said, a lot of places, other places in the country, you're fortunate enough to have very mineral rich clay. Um, here we get the benefit of having the sand because it's, it's nice and easy to dig in, but it doesn't offer much to the plants. And so it's a big, it's a big downside. So it's up to us to put those inputs back into the soil. And I guarantee you, if you put the inputs in, your plants will go from being alive to thriving. Okay, choosing the right plants and planting at the right time of the year is another variable. Okay, so if, and if you haven't been here very long and you don't have a lot of plants memorized, what, I would, what I'd recommend is taking a walk through the neighborhood, um, taking pictures of what looks good. You might see a neighbor's landscape where there's only one great looking plant. There's probably a reason why that plant's great looking there. It's the right plant in the right spot. Think about what conditions is that plant getting? Why is that plant looking so great there? And maybe there's three or four in that lawn and that landscape that doesn't look good. They're probably not in the right spot or there might be something that's up against them. So you can begin taking pictures on your phone, going on walks, recognizing what's doing good where, what shrubs are doing good, what plants consistently don't look good, okay? When I first, uh, started working here, we carried, um, in some ways, a little bit larger palette of plants. Over time, I've been kicking plants out of the garden, so to speak, because we were, a lot of times, uh, pushing the envelope a little too far. Um, so I'd mentioned that we're in purgatory, so we're not tropical and we're not temperate. There are a lot of plants that kind of leaned in toward the temperate side that would really have a hard time making it through their first summer here. Well, in the shade. Now, there's always gonna be exceptions too. There's always gonna be exceptions. And not everyone's yard is the same. But I don't, as a, as a garden center purveyor, I don't want to take the risk of exceptions, right? I wanna take a lot of the margin of error out of the equation so that people can come in here and feel pretty safe about it. They can just close their eyes and grab something, put it in the yard, and the odds are it's gonna do fairly well. So the, the point was is that there, just, there were a lot of plants that were on the edge of their comfort zone here. And we tempt ourselves with those plants because they're so beautiful and they're so amazing. Or they, it's something we grew just a little further north of here in central Georgia maybe, or in the Carolinas where they really thrived. And isn't North Carolina in the south? Yes, it is, but it's a completely different zone and a completely different climate than where we are now. And we can't ex What's that? And soil. And the soil is completely different. Yes, ma'am. What exactly is our soil? Depends on, 
It depends on exactly where you live. So we are going to be either 8B, 9A, and there are some microclimates that lean toward 9B+. Um, there is a neighborhood I used to live in on the other side of the intercoastal in Jack's Beach called Lower 18th. It is like a forest canopy of live oaks. All the houses, you can't see them. I remember I'd call it driving home to the bat cave because once I got into my little road there, you're underneath the oak trees. You couldn't grow half the plants here. It's just the shady plants that you can grow because we're literally under the cover of the oaks. And if you didn't rake your leaves like once a month, they'd be up to here. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Go on vacation for a while and you come back and the leaves are like up to your hips. Um, but it was lovely. But what you did see growing, there were a lot of really tropical things. People were using things like peace lilies for, sh for shrubs. And they're, they're probably still there to that day, to this day right now, um, which are a very tropical plant that people keep as house plants most of the time. People had lush bromeliads and all kinds of crazy tropicals that you see Orlando South were growing in, in that neighborhood there. So we have little microclimates. The closer you are to water, on average, the warmer you're gonna be, the closer you are to the beach, the intercoastal, the river, um, the warmer you're gonna be. If you have large oak magnolia canopy that will protect you and insulate you, you're gonna be a little bit warmer. Um, but most sides of town are gonna be 9A, and then out toward the fringes, north, west, even south and more inland are gonna be 8B, yeah. And even further south, like directly, like Nocatee is a little more inland, like even though they're further south, they're more like 8B, 9A, it just really depends. Um, and it can depend on one side of the street to the other too. You'll find that, you know, a neighbor might have big trees that protect them, but you have, you're wide open. And a lot of our new neighborhoods, if you've moved into a new neighborhood, they take all the old trees down. So you're out in the wide open. So there's no protection from the cold by having some big trees to help insulate, you know. Um, we carry mostly plants, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> zone for our area. But we do carry a lot of tropicals because we can grow them here. Most of the tropicals that we're carrying will, if you get them through the first winter, can come back from the roots. Starting over stinks sometimes. Um, sometimes we'll go three years, five years more without a hard freeze. We had one last winter, as some of you might remember. 25 degrees here for about 10 hours. Yeah. Under a big... big oaks help. So I was telling people they're trying to like wrap their heads around. They're like, I moved to Florida. I didn't think it freezes here. I'm like, well, it does sometimes. But usually we see this. It doesn't stay there at 32 or below for very long. It's like swings down and it's already on its way up. Not more than an hour usually, but a flat line for 10 hours. So you put, you fill up your ice cube tray and you put water in it. You know, you put in the freezer for a half hour or an hour, you pull it out, it's still water. You put it in for 10 hours, it's ice. And so a lot of these plants froze. And so what you realize is that when moisture freezes, it expands. So the cells in these plants, they freeze, they expand and they explode as they begin. Yeah, and so it ruins the tissue. Sometimes they can come back from the roots depending on the plant, sometimes not. So what I say about the tropical plants, it's really hard living in Florida and not having some tropicals, right? I would never say don't grow tropicals. I'm absolutely in love with them. Um, but you need to be, you need to be, um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. The closer you live to the beach, the more you can go in on the tropicals. The more you live in the tree canopy, the more you can go in on that. But don't put your, all your eggs in that basket, at least not your first season or two or three or four or five even. Slowly begin introducing them, get to know them. Protect them on those one, two, three nights that you may have to. Throw some blankets over them. Something cloth, something natural. Don't use plastic. Plastic does not help. Don't put trash bags over them. Um, I've seen people in tears who put trash bags over them. Um, don't put trash bags on top of them and forget to turn your irrigation off because that can get really ugly. Um, <laughs> irrigate them before um, so you can run your irrigation before the freeze comes. As that moisture, that wet soil begins to evaporate, it, be, it just keeps it slightly warmer. I'll tell you, every fraction of a degree we can get above freezing makes a huge difference. 32.5 is not freezing. 
32 is freezing. 32.1 is not freezing. You see what I'm saying? Every little ounce above 32 makes a big difference, okay? So the frost blankets, depending on which, which type you get, can raise the temperature two, four, six degrees if you put them on properly and kind of tent them, bind them down at the bottom, make a little air pocket around the plants, it makes a big difference. If you're in a pinch, you just have to throw sheets and blankets, that's fine too. Just covering them makes a big difference. And if you have any questions on the habits of some of these tropicals when you're shopping, you just ask us and we'll give you the tips and tricks on how to ensure they'll stay alive. Um, trying to think of what else we can begin to, to think about as far as some of our unique challenges. So the, the moisture is a huge challenge here, y'all. I think two years ago, we got almost five feet of rain. It's a lot of water. It's a lot of water. If you've lived on the West Coast or the, you know, other places in the country, you would, people pay dear money for, for water, you know? It's just like you, you would give your left toe for that much rain uh, in other places in the country. But here, unfortunately, we have sandy soil, not clay soil. Can you imagine clay soil with five feet of rain? It wouldn't percolate down very quickly. Uh, that'd be pretty nasty too. So the rain can cause a unique problem in that we get it so much all at once, it seems like, right? We'll fall into this pattern, and we had it this year, day upon day upon day, afternoon upon afternoon upon afternoon of rain. Um, and so if your plants aren't drying out in between those rainfalls, what's happening underground more than likely is that roots are rotting, okay? And if the roots are rotting, the plant can't sustain what's on top. So you're gonna start seeing spotty leaves maybe some brown on the edges and they're gonna begin dropping, sometimes slow, sometimes rather quickly, depending on how bad and how quickly the rotting of the roots is occurring. What I suggest to people is preventative maintenance is, is the best way to approach any particular potential for fungal damage. So keeping a systemic fungicide at home, on the ready, as gardeners, you should have that in your tool, tool belt, so to speak. Keep a systemic fungicide at home. Use it after our drought. So have any of you been here long enough to notice that we have a drought in the tail end of winter going into spring? Now we've had two unusual winters where we've been a little more wet than normal, but we did have a six plus week drought in the spring this year. And usually we have that four to six to almost eight week drought. In a lot of places in the country, when I was a child, my mom would sing, you know, April showers bring May flowers. We don't get those April showers usually here. It's very dry. So we go through this very dry, stressful period on the plants. So imagine like if you had to run a marathon and the marathon was summer and you didn't get to drink water before you ran that marathon in summer, okay? You're dry, you're dry, you're dry. And then all of a sudden, bam, like all this water all at once. And it's like trying to drink out of a fire hose. These plants are freaking out and then uh, they can't handle it. So coming out of that dry spell, and you'll know when it is, okay, coming out of that dry spell, and then as it begins to get kind of sticky outside, and you know when that is, when you walk out that first morning and you open the door and it's the same temperature it was when you went to bed, hot and sticky, that's when you start thinking about, that's when I wanna start using fungicide. Because the rains are more than likely probably gonna come or it's gonna be so humid for so long that the moisture alone is gonna cause some fungal damage on my plants. So that's when you think about applying a systemic fungicide. So is when it, a spray? it is, it's a drench. And so what you can do is you can, there's two ways it comes and a concentrate. And then I also, when I can get it, I'll have it in a bottle that you can attach to your hose and it'll mix it for you. Um, you can spray the leaves, but you wanna drench the soil. The, so the, the roots absorb it. It gets into the sap, it moves through the plant, and it kind of becomes like an internal medicine that kind of can ward off and keep funguses from taking root in the plant, okay? So it's a preventative maintenance. And they, depending on the metabolism of the plant, they can stay in the plant for several months. Slow growing plants, several months. If it's a fast growing plant or a short lived plant, um, it'll stay in for a shorter period of time, you might have to reapply it. But it's a great way to think about preventative maintenance on fungus. 
But if your plant's already healthy, and you're already doing things for the plants, like we talked about earlier about building the soil, making sure you're doing all those things, the odds of these things happening are less because it's just like us. When we're literally stressed, we all know that people who are stressed or get stressed are more likely to get sick because our, our immune system is compromised already. It's like we're pushing ourselves so far. So when plants are stressed and they're not healthy, they're more likely to come to succumb to secondary and tertiary and all these other issues. So keeping our plants healthy is key. So I'll circle back around again to the building of the soil. So the building of the soil, if you're doing it right and you're diligent about building soil and you're adding compost, you won't have to do a lot of extra fertilization. However, fertilization is an important part of keeping our plants healthy here. And everyone can choose a way to fertilize that they're most comfortable with. I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty because I, have, I still have people who come in on a weekly basis who ask for the strangest combinations of numbers on their fertilizers. There's like a bajillion combinations of fertil uh, fertilizer ratios that you could potentially use. And it, some people get very, very tied up on this particular set of numbers. And I'm like, I've never seen that ever. I don't know where you're gonna find it. But the main thing is that you feed your food. You feed them a plant food that either says general purpose, ornamental, now, if you want to get specific, get specific on types like acid loving. So if you have a lot of camellias and azaleas and evergreens and hollies, they like a really acidic soil. But if we think about it a moment longer, if we have a pretty alkaline soil here already, then maybe we could just be acidifying our soil as well. And that could be part of our regimen just to try to neutralize or bring that in a little bit away from the, this, the alkaline. All right, I am all over the place here, but I'm going to go back now to because I mentioned uh, the alkaline and the acidic. So what is pH to the plants? No one thinks about pH. How many of you think about pH on a regular basis when you're gardening? He does. Okay. So he's, he's, he's ahead of the game a little bit, and especially if he's beginning to think about how can I get my pH balance correct for the plants that I'm growing? Because the pH is similar to like the atmosphere that we breathe for plants in a way. And here's the analogy. If we were to have a little bit less oxygen, we'd still be alive, but we'd be really tired. We wouldn't be as vibrant. We wouldn't be as fun to be around. And we'd probably be more prone to get sick. If the pH is off for the plants, they are not able to do all the things that they can do, okay? They, for num number one, and the biggest thing, they can't absorb nutrients effectively. S some nutrients, they can't get it all when the pH is off. It binds it up for them and they can't absorb it at all. So just the pH being off, that alone will kill your plants and it'll be a slow death and you'll be doing everything else right. So with that said, for a relatively low cost, you can take a soil sample, either send it or take it into the Duval County Extension Office and they'll give you your nutrient readings for that bed and your pH balance. Now, if you have a large property, if you have several planting areas, it might behoove you to pay the extra money, take samples from each bed, label it, and then they'll give you a reading for each one of your samples because it could be different from place to place. If historically or currently you have a big oak tree, it's been dropping leaves and you haven't been shot vacuuming them off the ground before they can compost, the soil is probably leaning neutral or acidic because the, the, the oak tree leaves help add a little bit of acidity to the soil. Um, but it is good to know that. So you could be doing everything right and your plants could be suffering if you have an extreme alkalinity or an extreme acidity and your plants don't prefer either one of those. Trying to get it toward neutral is ideal. Um, when I started planting some new things, I put in the black cow mm -hmm. trying to make the soil a little better. Mm -hmm. Is that acceptable standard for all the, I just thought the soil would really Pretty. Yeah. So I was trying to do it that way. Yeah, so she was asking, um, her soil kind of looked cruddy, didn't look ideal, so she added some black cow. Is black cow the standard? Well, the black cow used to be the standard. It still can be the standard. Um, I have personally moved away from black cow and it moved in some different directions. Some of the problems I had with the black cow is that it's so thick and gloppy. Have you noticed that? And then when we have, uh, long periods of no rain which we do have and if you haven't thoroughly mixed it it can become brick like which is not ideal so 
I like uh, products that are less sloppy, like gloppy. I don't know what the right word is to describe black cow, but kind of like clay-like almost, but wet and moist. Um, they do make, the same company makes a mushroom compost that I like a little better. And then there are products that we're carrying called the uh, Wild Earth Mix, which is really nice. And then the top dressing. Now the top dressing has been um, screened and um, sifted to a fine small particle so that you can put it in a spreader, but it's still appropriate to use as a compost inside your beds as well. It can be used for both. I will say if you have problem spots in your lawn, the top dressing, I have never, except for this product in gardening, have never seen people's faces so ecstatic to the results they've gotten from them. Like there's no silver bullet in gardening, there's no magic wand, but the closest thing to it is that top dressing product for lawns. We have had customers from neighborhoods come in that were never our customers, but their neighbor was our customer. They used the top dressing, it remediated their lawn, the neighbors noticed, and they're like, my neighbor uses top dressing, where the hell is that at? Because my lawn sucks, and they're like, and we have new customers just because it works that well. So if you do have a struggling lawn or you don't want your lawn to struggle, that top dressing product is really good. And the way that it works is it's compost. Compost has living microbial life in it. It has natural, mild, um, natural, mild uh, uh, food for the plants that breaks down slowly. And then what you're doing is you're energizing, you're beginning to energize the soil and begin to replicate what's happening in the forest with that relationship between beneficial bacteria, microbes. It's like the gut flora in our stomachs for your soil. There's beneficial bacterium breaking down the food in such a manner and such a pace that the plants can absorb it in a natural way. So with the top dressing, so my flower, I have flower garden. Yes. And it's like now it's pretty mature and everything's pretty big. Is it okay to get the top dressing on the leaves or would you it would not it, it would not burn it. It would not burn the plants. Um, but you're gonna want to sprinkle it around the mature plants. Okay? okay. So, so when thinking about fertilizing, when you're putting down dry food or if you're applying liquid, you're wanting to feed um, the edges of the root system. Okay, the closer to the plant the roots are the less feeder roots there are. The roots move away from the plant, out to the edges of the foliage. That's where the most effective place is to feed. So if you have a tree and you have this canopy going this way and the canopy going this way, that imaginary circle around the edge of the canopy is where the roots are. And if they're not there yet, they'll get there. And roots have the ability to sense, literally sense food and smell it and sniff it out. I saw a documentary where they put cameras inside this glass bowl with soil. They had a plant in there and they had the cameras positioned around these little bits of fertilizer they'd put in. And the roots come alive. They look like worms and they start moving toward that little nugget of food. They know exactly how to get the food. You just got to get it there for them. Um, so you want to be teasing your roots away from the plants. When I first started fertilizing, I just throw it up against the trunk of the bush, right? That's the least effective place to do it. It wasn't until years later. You wanna move, get those roots away. You want as much surface area as possible. It's gonna create a much stronger, much healthier plant, whether it's a flower, an annual, or a long-lived tree or shrub. Palm trees, same thing. You wanna get those roots, you wanna feed them outside on the edges. So whether you're using a liquid or a, or a granular, you wanna out toward the edges. Yeah. I haven't been doing that either. I'm like right on top yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. So we talked a little bit about fungus. We definitely have, uh, have big issues with fungus here. And so we got to be diligent with our irrigation systems. We got to, number one, make sure they work. If you haven't inspected them, that's one of the first things you should be doing. I would start in the spring and probably check it quarterly. Don't assume your sprinkler system is effectively covering your garden. I mean, we would hope that it would be static and nothing ever changes. We've, I've seen so many issues where people thought they were getting coverage. They gave me a phone call, hey, my bushes are dead. It looks like it's really dry over there. I'm like, do you have irrigation? They're like, yeah, I got good coverage there. I go, well, when was the last time you ran it and looked at it? It's like, oh, okay. He ran and looked at it and there was a crack and it, was, it wasn't getting water to where it should, should have been going. 
And so there's just, it could be something as simple as that. You also wanna make sure that you're not getting um, too much irrigation too. Sometimes you can have too much coverage, okay? Um, sometimes plants grow and sometimes they cover heads. Sometimes they cover the sprayers. Sometimes they're blocking other plants from getting you know, the adequate water. So doing a regular run through at least once a year, if not more often, like actually turn it on on the day off and watch it work and make sure it's working. And then you have my neighbor across the street, God bless her, who runs it every day of the year. Goodness. Every day I'm leaving for work and the irrigation's just going, yeah. Anyway, it's crazy, rain or shine. Um, hers works all right. Um, but we had to be super careful during our rainy season. Why would we be running our irrigation when we're getting a foot of rain a month? It's, it's ridiculous. It's just, we're putting stress on our lawn. We're putting stress on our garden. Is it a pain in the butt to remember to turn it off? Yeah, but you know, it's better than a $500 bill to replace your shrubs or your lawn or your whatever, you know? Rain gauges, if you can upgrade to get a rain gauge, they work. They even have really cool ones now where you get an app on your phone and you can control your irrigation from your phone. It'll say, hey dude, it's raining. Why is your irrigation running? You're like, oh, and you just turn it off, you know? So there are some really nice tools with irrigation systems now. If you haven't upgraded your irrigation system, it's a, it's a great investment for your lawn and for your garden. Uh, I, mean, I don't know about the brands, but our company works with companies that install them and I've heard about them and they're saying really good things about them. Super easy to use, but don't be, uh, don't be running your irrigation more often than your lawn needs because too much water on the lawn can cause all kinds of issues. It can weaken the lawn it can keep the roots at the surface rather than going diving down deep, looking for moisture down deeper. You want a strong, healthy root system. So if you have a new lawn or a stressed lawn, you water less frequently, but for a longer period of time. So that water goes down deeper and the roots will follow it. Roots will follow it. They'll follow nutrients down deeper. So they'll follow where they need what they need. And so, did you have a question? I was gonna say, yeah. What about um, uh, St. Augustine? That doesn't go down. What about St. Augustine? Well, I'm talking about the root system. Um, if you water less often, but for a longer period of time, the roots will grow deeper. Also, growing your lawn as tall as you can stand it is going to shade the surface of the soil. You all have walked on the beach on a hot sunny day without sandals before, without flip-flops. Sand's hot. It's glass. And if you don't have a healthy lawn to begin with, that sun's gonna beat down on that hot sand and make it the scorchingly hot for those surface roots, which is gonna stress out your lawn. So if you're cutting it too short, it's just more sun that's baking that sand, heating up the soil and scorching the roots, those very tender roots of your lawn. And if it's not healthy and it's already stressed, that's just gonna another nudge off the deep end and causing stress to a plant. So leaving your lawn as long as possible that you can that you can tolerate without looking shabby is another way to give your lawn an advantage. Um, we have insects, um, which are a unique challenge here. Um, most of us are generally fortunate. Um, we don't have huge like plagues of locusts swarming through, fortunately. Um, you know, the grasshoppers generally are just taking a snack, so don't stress too much about the grasshoppers. We see them every once in a while. Our biggest threats really are the ones that are hard to see. Yeah. Well, we got yeah we have soil-borne pests, which it's very hard if we get those. Um, we have sap-sucking pests, which can cause all kinds of problems. And um, there are things like aphids. I've watched an aphid try to elude my gaze one time um <laughs> they're like so smart like so they're like very simple organisms they're like basically like a, a very like one in a zero robot like off or on yes or no but i remember seeing this aphid and i would move to the left and it would go around the back side of the stem and i'd go to the right and it would crawl around to the left. i was like i see you dude and i just like smashed it and i was like I got both sides but um if you're not out there looking and interacting with your garden, your success rates are gonna go way down. So what is a green thumb? Like there is no such thing as a green thumb, but there are certain characteristics of a person who has a green thumb. Number one, 
they probably enjoy gardening or are passionate about it. Number two, they interact with their garden. And three, they have, probably have some kind of personal or emotional or some kind of investment in it, okay? So if you're enjoying your garden from inside the house or on the patio or lanai, sipping your coffee in the morning, you're probably not gonna see the insects and the disease that's all throughout your garden until the plant's brown. Then all of a sudden you're out there the next weekend and you see this brown shrub. But it wasn't just brown overnight. It wasn't green the day before, right? It happened over a period of time while you're enjoying your coffee thinking everything was honky-dory. You have to inspect it. Unless you're paying someone to look at your garden up close and personal, things are probably happening, good and bad. And so you got to get out there every once in a while and just look at the bushes, look at the flowers, interact with them, look underneath the leaves. Do I see a whole bunch of white crud underneath it? They're nice and green and glossy on top, but those white little suckers are gonna spread themselves out all over and they're gonna suck and suck and suck and suck all the life out of that plant. And then one day, they're dead. But it was happening over a long period of time. So you have to get out there. Sorry, what are the black dots under the leaves? The black dots under the leaves, well, on a bougainvillea. Black dots, are, are they an insect that you're referring to? They're just stuck on the leaves, black dots. I'll have to. I'll have to look at it. Oh, you got one with you? <laughs> there you go. Boogies, boogies. I really wanted to save my boogies. She, here you go. All right, she brought some salad. <laughs> yeah, that's a scale insect. That's it's a scale. scale. Mm-hmm. Okay, while we're on the boogies. That's how pathetic it looks now as yes. opposed to when I got it. Yes. Okay, let me speak on that and, and also the, uh, the sap suckers. So the sap suckers, there's several different types, but they are the most insidious. Um, they cause the initial problem of, of being there. Um, the secondary issue of sucking on our plants. Now, just the sucking alone can cause problems. So these, some of these insects can go from plant to plant to plant. So if they suck on a plant with a disease and then go to your healthy plant and start sucking, they can transmit a disease. That's how a lot of diseases are transmitted by insects. And the insects themselves, a lot of times, unless they get out of control, we don't have a lot of issues with them. But it's when they begin to get out of control or they're transmitting secondary, third, or other types of diseases that we can have some serious problems because there aren't medicines for, for most diseases, like a bacterial or a viral type of infection in a plant, we're not gonna spend a few thousand dollars from a laboratory to get like a viral anti, you know, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna buy a new shrub for $15, $20. Um, so there's a lot of ways of looking at. My best advice is always trying to keep your plants healthy. A healthy plant can resist diseases just like a healthy person. Good thing we can't see all the viruses and things that are out there in the world because we're, we're coming across them all the time, but we have an immune system and plants have an immune system. So a healthy plant has a healthy immune system. So the, the first thing is that preventative thing that we're talking about building the soil, keeping our plants healthy. That's your first line of defense. Now, if you do have insects, most of the sap suckers can be controlled with very mild solutions and a very thick soapy water solution, spraying them over their bodies because they breathe through their exoskeleton, the out, outer part of their bodies, and it smothers them. So it's a very passive, non-toxic way of doing it. Now, you have to do it over and over and over again sometimes. If that doesn't work, there are some very effective insecticides that you can use. Um, the ones that I prefer to use are um, the systemics. Okay, not the, not the broad spectrums that you just spray all over the garden, because that can get a lot of the good guys too. We need the good guys. But the, the, the nice thing about the systemic is that you put it in the soil, the plant absorbs it, and it's kind of locked up in the plant itself. And it's mainly going to be the insects coming to suck on your plant that are affected by it. Um, it's, still, it's, it's still a poison. It is what it is. I would recommend not breathing it trying to cover your skin and not get it on you. But it works and, and, and it will protect your, your garden in a heartbeat. They're very effective. Um, 
The bougainvilleas um, can, can thrive here, they can, but we're not in California either. And we're not in the Mediterranean. So the Mediterranean garden, the California garden, and bougainvilleas are like this. Uh, we get a lot more rain, we have a lot more humidity, and the rain alone really stresses them out. So imagine you're a bougainvillea that has a root system that's not very tolerant of staying wet for long periods of time. And every single year, you lose X amount of your root system because it rotted during that month of rain we had. And you gotta start all over again. Every year it keeps getting hit. Every year it keeps getting hit. Every year. And, you know, they can push past that. They can get, sometimes they can move past that. Um, very, very well-drained soil. Um, you might, sometimes people even go above and beyond and can put more sand in the soil or gra mix gravel in the soil or grow them in pots and containers that have a very sandy kind of mix with the potting soil. Um, out toward the beaches where it's like dune sand, I see them can do very well, but then they can get burned by the salt spray the closer they are to the beach. Um, but they can do very well here. So I would keep them fairly well fed generally like a lower nitrogen so a smaller first number a little bit bigger first and or and second um, will help them if you put a lot of nitrogen into them you're gonna get a lot of green growth but not as many flowers they'll put a lot of their energy into the growth and not so much the flowering you on those be open at the top. mine's in a big pot mm -hmm. so that's um... yeah and they, and they need at least six hours plus full direct sun yeah all right, I'm, I'm gonna kind of uh, open it up to general questions at this point. I could literally talk about this for three or four hours. So if there's anything that you were wondering about in your specific garden, if there's anything I didn't talk about that you want me to talk about, I would be more than happy, yes. We have a lot of um, sparse areas in our lawn. And apart from putting the top dressing on, is there a time when we should seed it? It is St. Augustine grass, will that just fill in or should it? Okay. Yeah, they, they have a struggling uh, St. Augustine lawn. Um, I don't believe, and John, you might be able to correct me, I don't think there's seed for St. Augustine. I don't think I've seen, they don't, there's no seed. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, so you, you, most people buy pieces of sod, okay. like, like pieces of it. And if you need more than 500 square feet, you would buy a pallet of it. And a place here in town is called Roundtree, uh, Phillips Highway. I think they have two locations, and they'll, they'll deliver a pallet right to your home. Fill in though, like we have a big bald spot, but in the back it's just really sparse. Like if we, yeah, it area. it would eventually, it would eventually, but it may be a long road, and you don't want to have a muddy yard, right? So I would say probably what I would do is I would this time get some fresh sod down. The the upside to St. Augustine is that it grows and spreads, which is nice. It's not nice that it's not upright and soft, but at least it grows and spreads and can fill in other areas so by putting this the fresh pieces in whether you fill it completely or fill it most of the way it will eventually fill in and then at least once a year you do that top dressing right over the top of it you put it in a spreader you spread it over the top and that'll help keep it full of nutrients and then you know maybe letting it grow a little bit longer and then maybe letting some of the grass clippings fall down so that breaks down and feeds if you have trees in the area let the leaves fall mow over that and then make sure that you're not overwatering and not underwatering, and sometimes that could be a fine line. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. What tips do you have for putting plants underneath a pine tree? Plants for underneath a pine tree. Well, I would choose an acid lover. Okay. Number one. Um, so, is it, is it what kind of lighting is it underneath? Is it filtered, kind of open? It's. Um, I would say it's more sun than it is filter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are some gardenias that could do well there. You could create a fern or like what's called like a woodland type garden. There's lots of different clumping ferns that you clumping. could grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, underneath pine trees, underneath the oak trees here, um, it's a very unique situation because you're always having pine needles fall. Um, you could use the pine needles themselves as your mulch, right? It would make sense and just keep raking them in that area. Yeah, I would kind of create like a loose woodland garden. If you haven't been to the Arboretum in a while, you might check out the Arboretum. They have a lot of areas with oaks and um, 
and pines and things like that where they have a lot of needles and stuff like that. Um, even like the, um, like you could do uh, certain types of bromeliads, I believe in that area as well. Um, you should definitely come in one day during the week and, and pick my brain and we can do a little walkthrough and, and find some fun plants. But even like the asparagus fern, uh, not the asparagus, but the foxtail fern. Oh, oh yeah. The foxtails would I do very the well foxtail. there. Foxtails love my yard. Yes. No matter where I put them. Some of the, some of the hydrangeas also could do well there. Yeah. There's, there's several acid loving plants like in, in, in evergreens, holly type plants. There's shrubs that are in the holly family that would do very well there. How tall would they get? Well, there's some dwarf varieties. Yeah, it would depend on which variety. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have uh, three camellia bushes. It's three camellias. They're doing very nicely yeah. and they're getting ready to bloom. Um, I'm brand new to camellias. I have no idea what's going to happen. And the third bush is like in a holding pattern and hasn't, and it, it's a little triangle and it hasn't done anything. Yeah. Is now that, should I? I mean, given that we're moving into the colder weather, am I supposed to fertilize them now, or what? Are we yeah. Um, so, October is about the last month that I, that I usually put fertilizer down, uh, like a dry fertilizer, for example, like a slow release. October is usually about the last month. I let them most plants rest November, December, January, going into February. You could technically do your last feed in November, um, November, October, November ish. Every year is a little different, but we're trending a little cooler, it seems, this fall. Yeah. Doesn't it seem? Yeah, a little, yeah, little bit earlier than normal. Mm -hmm. um, and every year is different here. It's, it's a roller coaster. The seasons don't come like clockwork every year. I, I've been in the pool on Christmas Day before, you know, <laughs> when it's in the mid to upper 80s. And it's, it's just really wild. Um, we've had very warm Februarys, very cold Februarys. We had a frost in March last year mid-march you guys it was a nightmare we had just pulled the trigger on what we call the spring beast we unleash all of our purchasers who buy all of our plants all of our beautiful flowers for spring all of our tropicals we had just filled the garden center and then like out of nowhere this cold front comes in we're like oh my god so we like got all hands on deck we had to pull all of our plants inside, stuff them in the greenhouse, get the heaters out, put plants under the tables, blankets. Plants in the store. Yeah, in the store. It was cram packed. I mean, we literally spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars wholesale, which is a lot of plants. Um, it was amazing out here. And then just for one stinking night, we had to do all that work. <laughs> Just so the next morning we can pull them right back out. It was like 70 degrees. It was like so frustrating. It could have. It could have. Yeah. We haven't had an Indian summer this fall. Yeah, it's weird. So you all just have to be flexible. So yeah, be, flexible. Yeah, be flexible. Don't try the same thing over and over and ex expect different results. You all, you all got to like ask questions. Um, come in here. We love talking about plants if you haven't noticed by now this place is like full of plant geeks like we work here <laughs> for plants for a reason <laughs> we get paid in plants yeah <laughs> i have five virginia iris yes that were planted last fall they didn't bloom they didn't bloom none of them yes they might have been Yes, they might have been uh, still a little immature. So when we get them in the garden center, they're right at the cusp of being mature. Last year, you bought them last year? Yeah. Last year, they were kind of small. Yeah. Yes, okay, so I don't know if you guys heard a couple of years ago, there was that abnormal freeze in Texas. Yes. Yeah. Like abnormal, like zero, like 10 degrees. You know, most of those areas are the same zone as us. Could you imagine if it was 10 degrees here? Jacksonville would be brown simultaneously. Those areas of Texas turned brown and died simultaneously. Every residential property, every commercial property, dead. They have been a giant vacuum sucking the plants out of Florida for the last couple of years trying to recuperate. All their farms that grew all the plants that we have here all died at the farms. And so, your plant, what I'm getting at is she got a small plant that was a little less than mature than normal because the growers have been having a hard time keeping up with the demand 
since that giant freeze in Texas, because they grow the same, same plants as we do, a lot of those areas. And so um, we're starting to normalize. So normally when our uh, Apostle's Iris is what she's talking about, hers didn't bloom, it came in a little bit younger than they normally do. Um, most of our plants, not all, but most of our plants when they come in are either right at mature blooming age or very close to it. So if not this season, the following, okay? So I would say by now, years, this spring should put on a show. The Apostle's Iris, if you've never grown them, are spectacular. They're a wide, broad-leafed iris. They're actually right behind us. Um, they make a beautiful purple flower. Architecturally, they're really interesting with this fan-shaped pattern. The first year they bloom, maybe a month, just a little here and there. Second year, a little bit longer. And by the third year in each consecutive year, they can bloom up Is to there three months. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, she likes to uh, garden organically, and so do I. I. I don't like to use chemicals unless I absolutely have to. So, she has a plumeria. Yeah. Plumeria. 25, also 36. <laughs> she has a huge collection of plumeria. <laughs> She's my kind of person. So. Plumerias and canna lilies. Have anyone grown canna lilies? And have you seen those little orange specks on them, speckles? That is a type of fungus. And she wants... I have canna lilies, so you mean canna yeah, They can get them as well. They can get them from that and vice versa. Okay. How do you treat um, fungus organically? So there is copper. Copper is natural and organic. I sell copper. That is your most potent organic fungicide is copper. Um, there are also ways that you can utilize cinnamon I don't know how it does against rust because there's a lot of different types of funguses. So just because it says antifungal um, doesn't mean it will kill all funguses, but the copper does pretty well. The copper spray after the, I tried to put um, cornmeal gluten on yep. the ground and on the parts of something. It's just that um, certain variety was susceptible. Yes. I thought I would want and yes. I didn't get it, didn't get it. I mean, still flower. Yeah. Spot on the leaves. And she said something else that's kind of interesting too. So a lot of questions I get are, hey, I bought five shrubs, one died, why? I'm treating them all the same. I'm like, well, the best analogy I can think of is if you've ever interacted with children before, you could have five children and not one of them's gonna act the same, you know, <laughs> when you tell them to do something. It's all, they're all gonna be different. They're all individuals, okay? So yes, they're the same species. Yes, you might treat them the same, but crap can happen. I mean, every one of them is an individual. We all learned recently during this pandemic that all of us were affected differently by it, right? Everyone reacts, every living thing reacts to their conditions differently. And so, yeah, it, it, so plants, plants are just like any other living thing and they're not refrigerators and they're not toasters and they're not all going to behave exactly the same right out of the box they're going to be a little bit different so even if you treat them the same they're still a living thing and something can affect one over another uh, for sure so don't um don't be surprised um, and the longer you garden the more you'll see those types of things happen that sometimes just one plant doesn't make it and that's unfortunate but it is part of it and uh, the more plants you have and the more plants you've gardened the more plants that will die in your care or lack thereof um, there was an old master he, had, he was actually in, in bonsai or bonsai as some people call it he said you haven't learned your first lesson until you've killed a thousand trees <laughs> and in a lot of ways it's true especially if you're paying attention if you're paying attention you can actually learn from each, each one of those um, deaths and because you don't want it to happen again and you try to learn and you try and do something differently and you don't repeat the same mistakes over and over and gardening is the same way just like any other any practice in life yeah yes i have a, a huge live oak on one side of my front yard hangs over into the other side a little bit but under it is basket grass well, I might know it, but not by the name basket grass. Um, here, let me find some other ones. Um, basket grass. It's like a ground cover, and it's soft, and it's green, and it's fine with me. I mean, you hardly ever have to cut it. Yeah. I've, only, I've been here 15 months, so. Um, so last year, it turned, some of it that was in the most shade died, turned brown. 
some that was up the other side of my yard is St. Augustine. Nice. I, I know how to take care of it. I'm showing him a picture. Basket grass. But it's creepy. Oh, you're talking about the the wild the wild grass? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, some people I think call it forest grass. Yeah, yeah. Know, yeah. But it's jumped my sidewalk now into the St. Augustine. Yeah, Side it's a line. creeper. Yeah, it's a creeper, and when you pull it, it breaks really easily. Oh, it pulls up real yeah. easy. I yeah, yeah. Pull it all up in half a day. Yeah, the whole yard. Yeah, it pulls up real easy. Yeah, but I mean, the next year, it it's like little tiny leaves start popping up, and then it's back again. Yeah, but so it's probably seeding itself. Yeah, it doesn't have any. Well, they're yeah, they're probably uh, probably inconspicuous that you don't notice them. Um, a lot of grasses and grass type plants don't have showy flowers. They're just little funny little things that if you look real close at the right time of year, they're so I'm guessing they're probably dropping seeds. But also the fact that they're kind of a creeper, there might be bits of it underground still. And so what's happening is they're emerging from those bits and pieces that are left, and so. What do you do to get rid of it? I don't know if I want it. I mean, I, I'm not sure I want to get rid of it on mm -hmm. the oak tree side. Yeah, but how do you keep it out of your St. Augustine, you know? So, I don't like to use the H word, which is herbicide, but it, it might take a selective herbicide, um, and it wouldn't take probably more than one treatment to get rid of it. At what time? Oh, I'm not a I'm not a professional on spraying herbicides. Um, I don't even sell them here. It's just a, a philosophical thing. Um, but there are some very effective ones that will leave your St. Augustine alone, but we'll get rid of them. A lot of the weed and feed type products, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, is there a time of year that you recommend to the top dressing down? The top dressing down. Uh, we generally put it down in the winter time. Um, we do it for a couple reasons in the winter. Um, one, it's convenient for us to do it as a company. Um, but two, it's nice when it's cool. You do it in the winter time, and then as the, the lawn begins to wake up. Okay, so most of our lawns turn brown here, um, so they go dormant. And during that dormant season, you can put it down when it's nice and cool. Um, and then when the lawn wakes up, it, it can speed up that greening in the spring so that's one reason why people do it but what's nice about the top dressing is that it's mild it's all natural and you can use it year round you can use it anytime so we have customers come in and use the top dressing during the most stressful times of year and if they hadn't already done it the best time to, to use it is now <laughs> is right right now uh, use it right away um, if you have a stressed out lawn um, because the sooner you put it down the sooner it's going to recover now Going into the coolest months, the, the dormant grass isn't going to be doing a lot of growing and healing and, and any of that, right? So we put it down in the hopes of spring when we have a healthy lawn. Um, if you have a sad lawn right now, if you put things down, it may not do a whole lot because it's beginning to go dormant. Um, or it may heal if it's, it's something at the roots. The roots may heal, but you not, might not see the effects of it until spring once it begins growing and putting out new greenery yeah you can put top dressing down anywhere you can put on top of cornflakes <laughs> all natural <laughs> yes sir uh tropical fruit trees wise papaya seem to do well anything else tropical fruit trees so uh, you know we are like i said earlier in purgatory and we can't quite grow temperate fruit really reliably and we have a difficult time with tropical fruit reliably because of those few nights a year that we may have that can knock them back and they can knock them back so far because it gets so cold it stunts them so they may not do what you need them to do once it does warm up if they do survive it just takes extra TLC and but tropical is a wide range right there are some tropical plants that can take much colder temperatures than other tropical plants so it really does depend so i say experiment don't plant your whole yard in tropical fruit trees but try one 
here, try one there over a period of time, experiment, get to know the plant. Don't bite on or bite off such a big piece that you're trying to learn how to take care of all these different ones because they're all different. And that's the other thing too, we can't treat all of our plants the same either. You know, you might have a whole bunch of tropical plants, but they might not want the same things, okay? So getting to know your plants, doing some research, watching lots of YouTube videos. Fortunately, we live in the 21st century. We can know anything we want to know. We really can. And so I would take that time, do some research. We can push the boundaries a little bit, but there's a reason why you don't see a lot of that growing here. Yeah. Yeah, but the persimmons are a temperate, more of a temperate plant. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there, say that again? I was going to say, if, you were to, if I were to start with one, would it be papaya? Uh, the papayas can do well. You see, we, yeah, yeah, they can um, in certain parts of town more than others. Um, the only reason why that one's doing so well there is because it's protected by those trees and by the forest. It's so close and there's a waterway, a canal that runs right there. So it stays a little bit warmer right in that particular section of the nursery. It might be several degrees colder over there, you know. Just, just like 20 yards away. You had a question? Just on the top of the trees. Yeah. We have a guava tree at our yard this year. The fruit is well. This is the, our first year here. And then we'll see how it goes through the winter. Yeah, the guavas, there are, there's a lot of different types of guavas that can be grown here. There's two or three in particular that can do quite well. There are a lot of uh, uh, tropical, subtropical, type things that you can introduce to your garden. There's just a wide range um, of plants, but there's a reason why cherries and apples and things like that are grown further north. Um, there's a reason why peaches are not only grown for in Georgia, but further north in Georgia, right? It's not like south, south Georgia where they're being grown. It's not in Kingsland necessarily, you know? They need chill hours. They need to be cold and frozen for like five months of the year. That's not what I want. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it's that we're not, I mean, you, you, we will bring in some of the most um, likely candidates that could produce here. So there are a range of chill hours that certain uh, types of apples, for example, or certain types of pears and certain types of nectarines that require less chill hours than others. So we will bring those in. Um, there are many... Um, uh, places uh, out west in the Panhandle, uh, farms out there that we will buy some of those fruit trees from, some of the stone fruit, um, not cherries, but some apple varieties, some pear varieties, some nectarine varieties. Uh, the loquat tree, which is that evergreen bushy one right here uh, behind these figs, um, the loquat provides a nice little plum, which is absolutely delicious uh, fruit, um, very tasty. Um, the figs do very well here. The citrus can do very well here. Um, the mulberries can do very well if you can keep the birds from eating them first. Um, and avocado. Somebody here in the crowd has an avocado tree. Didn't you say it came from a grocery store avocado? And you have two of them. She's, th she's in Arlington. And she's got like 20 foot plus tall avocado trees. It's crazy, yeah, yeah. They're absolutely stunning, and uh, but you, but not every side of town. So you got to really get to know your area, or plant a fast-growing tree like a like our native red maple and create some canopy, you know, to create a little microclimate. You know, think about planning ahead and creating little microclimates in your in your space as well. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Can you grab some sweet fruit back onto those so they grow? Okay, so she has a citrus that used to be sweet but isn't sweet. I'm sure there are multiple reasons why that can happen. Um, have you maintained the tree so that there's no branches coming from be down below where the original graft was? Yeah, well, three of them, yes. One of them has multiple branches coming up now, or at least like the scar out of the ground. Mm -hmm. But the majority of it has the, the, the trunk that comes up and then the branches that come off. That's why I was wondering if I could grab something on it. Well, one, well, you need to start practicing grafting, number know, one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's not quite as life or death, but it is like doing surgery uh, in, in, you know, with the plant. And so, um, so all citrus are already grafted. 
Um, so what ha the most likely reason why oranges become um, sour or seem to be becoming more sour is because branches can begin to grow from below the graft. All of the uh, rootstock is the original citrus, which is a sour uh, citrus. And so why yours is, I'm not sure. I, what you would do again is we have a great resource, which is the Duval County Extension Agency. These are people with PhDs. I'm just a geeky plant lover, but some of these people actually have a PhD in plant nerd, and you can call them, and they love talking plants with you as well. And so some of these types of things to get down to the nitty gritty, um, I would call the Duval County Extension Agency, explain to them what you're experiencing. They might have some solutions. Now, as far as grafting at this point, probably not. You would and not get it all mixed. Not, it just doesn't make sense at this point to do it because you have so many branches. Like where would you graft to number one? I mean, if you were to cut the whole thing back to nubs and then begin starting all over from a, from the rootstock, but you had to go to the rootstock. So it'd be, you might as well just buy another citrus tree, I think at that point. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. I saw another hand, yeah. Use it to talk for us. Yeah. When I plant something new and just toss some yes. whatever It's great. It is. Yeah, it's good. It's a nice, like, organic form of, of slow release nutrients for the plant. I carry a different brand. Okay. It's basically the same thing, but it's not poo from Milwaukee. It's it's a, it's dried differently. It's called Sustain. Okay. I carry it in bags of little pellets. Looks like uh, uh, grape nuts, you know, the little okay. tiny pellets. Yeah. Good stuff. It's slow release. It's not going to do anything quickly. Um, but it's a nice slow release food it's great for your lawn for your garden anywhere every time it rains every time you water or irrigate it breaks down slowly and feeds um, the closer you can get it to the roots the better so if you have mulch i mean if you take the time just to pull the mulch away and put it underneath and put the mulch back on top it gets it that much closer to the root system um, you can put things on top of mulch and that's fine but you have to imagine where are the roots right <laughs> that that nutrient's got to travel it's got it's got to break down so okay imagine like on a molecular scale right you got these chunky bits roots absorb molecules of nutrients right so it rains little bits dissolve works this way eventually through the mulch eventually through the soil eventually to the roots so the closer we can get things to the roots the better it just speeds up that uptake when we're talking about dry solid food which is why I like to supplement all my plants with a, a water soluble food because it's immediately available. So if I'm sick now, I'm really sick, and the doctor says, I got two cures for you. I got this solid food that you can chew. You might die in 10 minutes, okay? And it's gonna take a half an hour for you to digest this before your gut absorbs it. Or you can drink this liquid and it immediately goes in your bloodstream and you're cured. I'm gonna drink the liquid every time. So if you have a sick plant or a stress plant, you throw that dry food down, it's designed to break down over a period of months, right? It might get its first dose in a few weeks, maybe, to get all the way through the soil. So just think of that as well, because um, I have people who come in, I have this sick plant, I've been feeding it, um, I've been throwing down this, I go, well, it may not get that in three months, it might be dead by then. And so it's not necessarily that the food is a cure, but the, at least by being well-fed and giving it nutrients, it, it, it gives a sick plant the ability to hopefully pull through. It's not a cure-all, but at least you can get some immediate, immediate nutrients to the plant. So, sorry, what is the liquid that I'm just talking about liquid fertilizer in general, okay. anything that's yeah. water-soluble or liquid already. Okay. All right, one more question, yes. What's the number one liquid you recommend for mealybugs? For mealybugs? We talked a little bit about the sap suckers earlier, so I always would like to try the soapy water solution, if I can. Sorry, yeah, got it. There's also some horticultural oils that are th thick and you can mix with water and neem oil, um, which is also good. Just be careful with neem oil in the heat of summer because it can scorch leaves when it's really hot, especially like papery, thinner leaves that aren't hard and waxy. I I've scorched some of my vegetable plants before um, that had some like sap sucking bugs on them. Yeah, for sure. All right, it is beginning to get dark, and uh, I appreciate your patience and listening, and uh, you guys can come visit us anytime. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.